We've been diving into some Jonathan Kaminga talk, Trace Jackson Davis. I just wanted to stay with BP, as he's known, Brandon Pajemski, because I, I think these guys are sort of like, he's one of one. You don't, there's a high level of risk with every draft, whether it's the NBA and the NFL. And, and this is, this is one of those guys that it's not so much what it is that he does on the floor because he's obviously impactful. You talked about the rebounding. But there is an infectious attitude and just the charges this guy takes that I just think resonates with people. He is, you know, he's one of those guys that just, he's not wowed by the moment. And I also was taking a lot of calls yesterday that people were pointing out it's just unfair how he's been able to leapfrog and jump Jonathan Kaminga as far as minutes. Jonathan Kaminga is in his third year, and Bajemski's getting more, more, more run, more time. And I was asked, well, why is that? My response is, is because he's so much further along, as is Trace Jackson Davis. When you just talk about how these guys are wired and just sort of the game itself is not too fast, as it was for Jonathan Kaminga the first two and a half years, it's obviously slowing down for him now. But Brandon Pajemski, for a rookie, very rarely does he have the deer in the headlights or does he make the sort of blatant, repeated mistakes that you saw by Jonathan Kaminga early on in his career? Although, again, he's at a place now that it's we have you know, that he's he's at his most effective in his NBA career, and we hope that continues. But for whatever reason, and you just don't know this with Brandon Pajemski or any rookie until they get an opportunity to play, and sometimes you hit on a guy that just looks like he's been doing this his entire life, Larry. And I think that that. This is a special, special basketball player. And I know I'm being a bit effusive, but you just don't meet guys or you don't find guys like this that you can play immediately and feel comfortable with the ball in his hands in the closing moments. And that's included in you know the last 90 seconds of a game that's hanging in the balance in the fourth quarter. I mean, a lot of it comes down to rebounding. You know, I mean, I in my mind, I mean, it's also there's a lot that goes into it. But I mean, look at look at Pajemski, six point nine rebounds per game. That's what he averages. Kuminga averages three point eight. Kuminga is the bigger six eight. Yeah, Kuminga's is he? I thought he was more like six ten. I mean, he's definitely big. I mean, he's a six nine six eight guy, but he plays big. Uh, he's got huge vert. He's a great athlete. Long arms. He's a phenomenal talent. Um, but he averages three point eight rebounds a game. And Pajemski averages close to seven. So I think there's that. And then, um, I, though I'll say this, I, I, if, if, I, if Steve were sitting here and I said, Steve, you know, if he said, hey, what do you think? I would say, not that he would, but if he did, um, I'd say play Kuminga more. Play Trace Jackson Davis more. Stay with Kuminga more. Um, develop Kuminga. The fact that they got to the playoffs last year – and it was like two, one or two games of Kuminga, and it was like get him off the floor. I mean that that was that means you didn't do enough in the regular season to either define his role properly, communicate enough to him, or bring him along enough in the regular season. I mean Charles Barkley calls the playoffs the NBA's second season. It goes on and on and on and on. It started Halloween. You got all of December, all of January, all of March, April when the playoffs start. I mean, you got you got months and months and months. You get eighty two games. Define his role and get him in a role that you're that you're that you want him in and that's comfortable for him. And define it for him and get him out there and play him consistently. Let him know his role and don't yank him as soon as things go south in a game or two. So I just think that there needs to be a little bit more commitment to Jonathan Kuminga, um, and yet. I'll tell you what scares the hell out of me. I, it scares me that they're going to maybe trade Jonathan Kuminga and Moses Moody. If Steve said, "Hey, I'm, I'm we're thinking about trading these guys," I'd say, "How about play them more? You know, how about play those guys a little bit more?" I, I think, in defense of Steve Kerr and the Golden State Warriors, where you hear a lot, "Well, why don't you go with the rookies? Why aren't the rookies getting more run?" That the Golden State Warriors, unlike that of the majority of teams in the NBA are one of those plug-and-play, and, and the goal is to win an NBA championship. They're, that's basically, you know, that's the high-water mark, and they're in that conversation, and this is, you know, as long as Steph and company are upright 
and still are somewhat in their prime, and Steve Kerr is still Steve Kerr, then the goal is once again to run it back and win another title. What's difficult for any rookie that's coming in to a franchise or a team where that's the goal, this isn't Washington, it's not Detroit, it's not Charlotte, it's not Portland, it's not Utah. You're just not going to get a lot of run if you're Jonathan Kaminga two years ago or Moses Moody. It's going to be limited because, you know, we got three Hall of Famers and Andrew Wiggins and Kevon Looney, and they're, you know, in many regards, a, a historic starting lineup. So any, I think you have to take into account that the Golden State Warriors are a team that aspires to titles and for any young player that's coming into a system like that, that they've got to recognize that they've got to earn minutes and that they're going to be on a much, much shorter leash if they were with one of the before mentions, the Detroit's of the world. I mean, you look at OKC, and OKC, along with Minnesota, have now, you know, ascended to the top of the conference. And why is that? Well, because all those kids for the last two or three years got a chance to make all those mistakes. Josh Giddy and, you know, Chet Holmgren and company, although Chet was out last year, but Jalen Williams, all those young players that are now coming into fruition, including Shea Gilgis alexander they all got a chance in real time for 82 games to play, play poorly, play good, take a step forward, take two steps back on crappy teams. Well, the Golden State Warriors have never been that. So it's a difficult balancing and juggling act, I think, for Steve Kerr to appease the youngers, youngsters and still be relevant, if that makes any sense. Uh, to me, it just uh, I think that if Kuminga went to the glass and rebounded more, there'd probably be more minutes for him. I mean, take a look at what he's done in the month of December. He's had like six games where he had five uh, under five rebounds. Pajemski's got no games where he's had under five rebounds. Pajemski's had the last four or five games, 9, 10, 7, 5, 5, 5, 7, 11. I mean, he's, he rebounds the ball. And I mean, what what you know? People talk about, oh man, I would love to see Wiggins get back to the Wiggins that he was when the Warriors won the title. What did he do on that run? He rebounded yes, he the did. basketball, you know, and he did it consistently. And when you rebound, you, you know, obviously you get more possessions. It helps your team. Um, it's the workmanlike stuff that you know. I'd love to see Wiggins rebound a little better. I'd love to see Kaminga, especially since Kaminga's got the uh, talent to really, if he devoted himself to it. Um, but why I don't want to move Kaminga is that, man, when he gets in defensive position and you're looking at him, you're like, wow, man, look at this guy in, in total defensive position. 6'9", long arms, great quickness, good luck getting around him. He can dev- dev- uh, defend multiple positions, and I just think there's upside potential for him to be just a lockdown, awesome defender. And we're not seeing it consistently, but, man, he flashes it. And when you're watching it, you're like, wow, this this is what this guy potentially could do. So um, I had a buddy of mine, Dan, who threw out a trade the other day. And I and I was like, wow, I don't know if, uh, if Phoenix would do that. But his trade was Wiggins, Green, and Moody, and maybe a, a, a pick or two to the Suns for Durant. And I, I you know, I, I thought, well, first, my first thing was, dude, why is – why, why is Phoenix doing that, right? But, you know, if if Phoenix was of the mindset to move on from KD, that, I mean, to more, more so than Siakam, KD is the kind of guy that I think if you added to this mix, I know it would be a second time around, it would be a huge emotional thing, and you'd be moving Draymond Green in this trade. But to me, if you really want to give Steph another chance to win a title— that is more the kind of move that I would want to make. Now, I don't know that Phoenix would do it, and I don't know how many number one picks you'd have to throw at them, and they probably would want Kaminga in that deal as well. But that does work in the trade machine. Wiggins, Green, Moody, and picks for for KD. Um, if I could make that move, I would make that move. And even though KD's whatever he is, 35 or whatever. Yeah. But I don't know that Phoenix is in that mindset to move on from him. But I I guarantee that Dunleavy's probably considering any and all options uh, out there as you know when the trade as the trade deadline draws closer. What's it first week in February, something like that? Yes, and it's not going well for Phoenix. They just snapped the three game losing streak, and the experiment with with Beal and KD and 
uh, Booker is just it's it's not working. So if this continues, they may look to unload. Lucas is like, there's no way that's enough for Katie. Well, there's absolutely no way that's enough. That's why my first reaction was, there's no way. But how many number ones? Well, that's what this comes down to. You're going to have to get rid of someone like Jonathan Kaminga. If you want to improve your team this year, you have to give up a promising young asset. And this team doesn't have that many. I mean, they have more right now than they probably have over the last couple of years with how good Pajemski and Trace Jackson Davis have been. But you're going to have to move off Kaminga. If you Those want. guys are untouchable, I think. I, I think if Kerr was here, he would say there's no way in hell you could touch either one of those two guys. Trace right. Jackson well, Davis or Pajemski? You, you don't care yeah. about getting better then. Well, no, I got Kaminga. If I'm going to think about you know a trade piece that I don't want to move off on, I could be convinced if I'm Steve Kerr that Kaminga's that guy. But in terms of Pajemski and Trace Jackson Davis, no. Because if I'm going to abridge you know, and stay relevant as these guys get older, I'm talking about the foundation and Draymond, Stephen Clay – the Hall of Famers, and if I'm going to bridge and stay relevant, I need a core. I need a future, and that's you know that's who those two are to me. Well, I mean that's and that's that's the Joe question too. It's like, all right, Joe, you got this opulent, unbelievable arena that's very very expensive. You don't want to gut your team and drive it off a cliff, which is why you what even brought you to the two timeline concept is the the idea is you know what you got to have somebody who's driving people through the turnstiles to pay big dollars uh, to fill up that arena. So I understood business-wise. In some ways, when I took the tour for the Chase uh, you know, Chase Center the first time, I thought, wow, look at this place. This is really, really something else. In some ways, the Warrior business community challenged the Warrior basketball people to keep this thing going beyond the basketball lifespan of Clay, Draymond, and Steph – because that arena is so fancy and so opulent and so beautiful and so expensive that you're going to have to have a good team. You're going to have to have good, you know, a good team for a number of years to drive three people through the turnstiles. So, um, so it's going to be. I don't. I don't envy Dunleavy. No, you know, I he's a young D- GM in his first go around. He's got big decisions on his on his table and. Um, there, I'll say this. If you move Jonathan Kuminga, you better get something going in the present that's going to be worth what that kid's going to evolve into in the future. You're exactly right, Larry. I want to say something to you guys, to the listeners, and most pointedly at our YouTube comments. Because when I said you have to get rid of someone like Kuminga to get anything back in the short term, I hear a lot of Warrior fans say we're wasting Steph's prime. Right, You heard that right. before they won the championship. You heard that last year. You heard that even probably at some point this year. you got to make some decisions on where your priorities are as Warriors fans and where your priorities are if you're Joe Lacob or Mike Dunleavy. You have to make some decisions. Do you care about the bridge to the next great Warriors team or do you care about this time right now with Steph Curry? Those are the hard decisions they're making and these are the things you have to wrestle with as a Warriors fan. How much do you want to see what Jonathan Kaminga can be in a couple years in a Warriors uniform? Or do you want to try and win a title? Like, you have to be able to make that decision in your own mind as a Warriors fan because that will get that will get to the, ba- the, the base of your decision in this question. Well, I think getting back to Joe Lacob, he sees this through a business lens. And you're right, Larry. I, I think that, you know, there was talk a couple of years ago when they had the lottery picks, we'll give up those lottery picks and let's go get Bradley Beal and let's win right now, there was no way in hell. First of all, it was so unique that a team that good and still had these guys in their prime, relatively speaking, and I'm talking about the Hall of Fame core, and you got two lottery picks. Of course, Joe Lacob, listen, I don't have to win titles. I just need to stay relevant. I just have to get us into the playoffs because you need people to, you know, that's a, that's a revenue model. He sees this through an entirely different prism than the typical fan, I think. When you're looking at it from a business context, yes, you got to keep pushing that ball down the road, man. This whole idea, let's go in, let's all go in right now, this year, from a CEO and a guy who comes from a business background, makes no sense. Because you're thinking about tomorrow, and you're thinking about funding a new stadium. And so Joe Lakin may see this through an entirely different uh, lens than than any of us. So let's get out to the phone lines. 888 957 
If you want to get on J.K., do you trade him? Do you hang on him? What do you think about the youth going forward? We start things with David hanging out in Berkeley. David, what's on your mind? Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, the one question I keep hearing is uh, about developing the players, and nobody brings up the assistant coaches. Kerr can't, can't be the guy to develop. It's assistant coaches and how many we've lost. That has been the key to everything, and you just look at the the, the, the coaches that we've lost, and you and all these guys that you have on the bench that are what, what are they doing? You you talk about development, Kaminga and all well. The San Antonio when they were going well, they developed. Kawhi Leonard was developed. Kaminga has not been developed because you don't have assistant coaches that can. You got ex coaches that weren't good coaches now on the bench, and nobody has said anything about Atkinson and all the rest of the guys. I, I'm just trying to figure out what, where, where are you? You talk about the players and everything else, but but, but what's going on with that? Here, that's, I'll that's also a key part of development. That's development. I hear you. I totally hear you. But I mean, the NBA GM survey doesn't Kenny Atkinson get voted like the last three years as like the number one assistant in the entire league by GMs around the league? But I don't think Atkinson, and if he's alluding to Mike Brown now in Sacramento, they're not working with players on a daily basis. Those are the guys in the sitting behind the bench. Those are the guys that are working with the Kamingas on a daily basis. I don't think guys that have that assistant are sitting next to Steve Kerr. I don't think that's their role when it comes to Kenny Atkins and you're talking about Mike Brown. So what he's referring to, if you're talking about development, it's that, you know, that tabernacle choir of all those guys – that are sitting, they go like, you know, I laugh because when I was growing up, you had like three dudes on the bench with the assistant coaches. Now they go like... The fans were in round, row two. Yeah, they got now, like they now, go 14 now the deep. assistants are in row two. But those assistants, I think, sitting behind Steve Kerr, the guys that none of us are really familiar with, that's where all the developing begins and ends. Let's get out to... Uh, you had something to say you want to talk well, about? Well, no, I, I saw a, a, somebody on the uh, 925 on the, on the text line said... Larry uh, Pods has more rebounds in Kuminga, partly because he gets at least 10 to 15 more minutes a game. That's not true. Pods plays in the month of December 29.2 minutes per game on average. Kuminga's playing 24 and a half. So, you know, it's, it's try five more minutes. He's getting, Kuminga's playing five fewer minutes per game than Pajemski, not 10 to 15. Want to get out to Albany. And Kevin, before I take you, now I don't know if someone's, well, I tell you what. I'm just without further ado. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tease this anymore. I won't even. I won't even read what it is that's next to your name. Well, I am trading Curry. Oh, Kevin, you better come strong, oh. my man. Talk to me. Hey, look, man. I, you know, I go back to the Bernard King, J.B. Carroll days. I've been a diehard Dubs fan for for a long time. But look, and I'm not suggesting this, but. If the Warriors are really serious about getting Curry another ring, maybe we should talk about trading him if you want to get him another ring. Because the way this team is going and everything is the way it is, it, it, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. I mean, look, we're talking about keeping a 20-year-old talented player or, or getting rid of him or, or what. This isn't the, the Dubs way. Are you trading driving, Curry, Are you though. driving home from the holiday party there, Kev? You've been swimming in the uh, the holiday punch. Look, uh, like I said, I don't. You know, I'm not. I don't even. Uh, like I said, it's sacrilegious to even bring it up. But how serious are the Dubs about getting him another ring? I mean, I okay. First of all, when people say, "Hey, talk about getting Steph another ring," they're talking about getting Steph another yeah, ring not with another team with the Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> and then, if you ask yourself, where would if Steph were going to play somewhere besides here? Sure. Where do you think he would be? Where do you think he would want to play? If you ask me that question, my guess would be Charlotte, where he's from, or Madison Square Garden. And yet, he's not winning a ring in either spot. <laughs> so, um, so if there, if the Knicks were a step away, or if Charlotte were a step away, a, you know, Steph Curry away, um, you know, maybe if they had the right pieces, and uh, you know, you, but no. <laughs> just no. Uh, I can't even think of another spot that they would. I think I would be very interested to know if Steph, if it came right down to it, Steph, would you rather finish here or get that one more ring? What would he say to that? Would he rather finish here or get one more ring if he couldn't do both? 
I think, I think he, he'd rather finish here. Yeah, he's entrenched in this. But community. maybe not. Uh, that's maybe he wants that ring. Maybe he, maybe he feels like that ring. You know, his legacies. He's a he's a he, he's already one of the greatest players of all time. That's never going to change whether he wins any more rings or not. If ever there was a player in the history of sports that is untradeable, it's Steph Curry. <laughs> and I don't need to sit here and tell you what he means. We just talked about Joe Lacob and revenue and how he sees things going forward with the new stadium. But what it is that's you can't he pulls down more than fifty million dollars a year. That's still underpaid for what what he means in terms of PR, brand, merch. There's you can't put a price tag on what it is that he's worth to a basketball team, not only as a player, but in every other regard. Oh my god. And and if you're Dunleavy, the one mistake, I mean, and the, believe me, Mike Dunleavy's not um gonna make this mistake. But you gotta know. If you're entertaining, because like who knows, maybe the Nurkic uh, head slap put Draymond in a different category with the Warriors than he was prior to that, or maybe Clay's season this year has put him in a different category uh, with the Warriors and how they view his his or or the fact that they've offered him two years and whatever it is, fifty million, and he doesn't sound like he's too excited about that. Maybe these things have put him in a different category. But the one thing, if I'm Dunleavy, that I gotta know is I gotta know how Steph would react to a trade involving either one of those guys before I make the trade. Because could you imagine if they traded a Draymond Green in some deal and then Steph was like, I'm outraged, I want out. <laughs> That's it. That's my guy, I want out. Oh, he's definitely you've got You've got to cross that bridge of talk, communicating with him and figuring out where he is in this thing and where how uh, you know, how he feels about it and how he wants to play his hand of cards. 